everyone. Today I have a interview with uh, director Greg, Greg uh, McGillery for his special release of an amazing film that he directed in 1972 entitled Five Summer Stories, which is considered the greatest surf film ever made. The film will begin its journey on August 12th, 2022. This amazing film has been digitally remastered of this classic surf documentary for its 50th anniversary, a cultural touchstone and time capsule from a truly watershed era when the world was at a critical crossroads. Five Summer Stories captures the state of surfing on the verge of creative transition, raising the surf film art form to a new level and setting the genre artistic standards for the next two decades. Welcome to the show, Greg McGallery. All right, it's a truly honor to, to meet you. And I just wanna say that it's, it's truly a time capsule and definitely a different time than now. But thankfully that you, I'm very happy that you created a film of such art back then to bring it back now at a time where I think society needs a moment of time to escape. It's that, is that the reason why for you as a filmmaker that you brought back this uh, wonderful remaster classic uh, serve documentary? Uh, why now? And it's not just because it happens to be the film's 50th anniversary. Well, the, the, <laughs> that, that's one of the reasons, but the, the, I think the value of this experience is, is to allow people that were there 50 years ago and those who saw the film in its run, which was 1972 through 1979, um, to kind of reflect on that time period and where their lives have come in those 50 years. Um, now the, you know, 50 years is a long time and, and a lot has happened since then. Um, and actually most of it good, most of it better for the ocean. Um, right. In the film, we, we criticize the treatment of the ocean as kind of a dumping ground and and we realize that that's not the way to go. And today we, we are treating the ocean far better. Um, you know, and there are groups like uh, Oceana and, and World Wildlife Fund and others, uh, including our little group called One World, One Ocean, that basically work hard to figure out ways to keep the ocean healthy so that the plants, the sea critters, even the little algae that live in the ocean right, that create right. oxygen for us. Everything in the ocean is critical to us here on land. And we are now understanding that better than we did 50 years ago by a long shot. Yeah. And so, you know, though you reflect on, okay, there's a lot of things happening in the world today, but actually today the ocean health is better um, we're more conscious about it. Um, the billions of people on our planet know that they have to treat the ocean, which is 71% of our planet. Sure. We have to treat it as if it's critical to us because it is. Right. Um, I'm, a, I'm a sustainable guy. So I grew up, you know, I was an energy guy before I got into the film industry. So I'm number one, I'm there with you and yeah. I'm a fighter and uh, everybody who knows me knows that, um, especially when it comes to wildlife and the oceans, I'm, I'm the first one there, trust me. And, yeah. and you're right, there's a lot of groups. And, but back then when, when that was going on, um, you know, Vietnam was just, you know, hopefully f phasing out and I, when you did this film, I, I, I connected with it because um, I think it's a great time to show it because 
a lot of people are going through a lot of issues like with climate change and the environment and other political matters that are happening right now. And I think people like myself, when I saw the film, I escaped for that, you know, one hour and 30 minutes of time. Yeah. It was so well, beautiful. Yeah, that's the key, you know, and the music is so critical to this film because it, it's a slice of time back, you know, to 1972. And the two groups that created the sound were Punk, a group from Laguna Beach who are still my best friends, and the group, the Beach Boys, who are world famous, and they were undergoing a transition in their style of art. And it was the perfect time for me to engage with both those musical group groups and get them to work with me on the film. And it was... Uh, so the, the so the music is at least fifty percent of the dynamic oh, positiveness yeah. of the experience. Um, it really does touch you in a way that that not very many movies do touch you. Yeah, well, it, it, you did a great job at that. And what what reaction do you think you'll receive or expect on your film today compared to nineteen seventy two? I think it'll just be joy. I think, um, you know, it's it's a serious movie, but it's also more than that. It's joyous. Yeah. It celebrates the beauty of nature and kind of the 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 grace and and magnificence of the surfing art form. So yeah. you end up seeing a new slice of life um and 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 i think that's why as a as a film it became a cultural touchstone to a whole new generation of young people who said you know i'm going to think about my life more seriously and differently than what my mom and dad did i'm yeah. going to evaluate where i want to go and you know, everyone was serious about where they wanted to go, but it was a different place than where the older generations were, were going on their own. But, you know, at, at that time, we didn't have the internet, we didn't have phones. <laughs> no. And, and there was something about unity. We were more, I, I believe that we were more united then and a lot more communications. And, and you could get that with the film because... You see the gathering, the surface, the talking to each other, and just, you know, especially that scene of everybody skateboarding, you know, <laughs> and you didn't see a cell phone in their hands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, which is great, you know, and um, what I want to know is where are the surfers today, like the ones that were in the film, like uh, Corey uh, Corral and uh, uh, Jerry Lopez and Rory uh, Russell? Yeah. Well, Jerry, uh, Jerry Lopez, who was the main star of the film, right. he's living uh, in two places. Uh, one is up in Bend, Oregon, uh, and the other is in Hawaii, on Maui. Wow. So he goes back and forth, and he's got a great life, wonderful family, wonderful wife. Um, and he's, he's made his living doing a multi multiple things. Um, he endorses surfboards, so you know you see his name on surfboards all over the place. Um, you know he he writes uh, magazine articles. He uh, does promotions for various companies, um, and so he's figured out a way to make a living through his surfing notoriety and his talent, which is he's a very very talented and very intelligent human being. Corky Carroll was actually the first professional surfer. He's right. the first surfer who actually made a living from, from surfing. And he's one of the funniest people that I've ever been around. Um, you know, I, I always, whenever we'd go to Hawaii to shoot a movie, I insist on Corky staying at, at our house because, you know, he was joyous, you know, like, yeah. 
always had an idea of what to do that day. Always had a funny joke. Always had things to say about everything. He was opinionated um, to a positive effect. And, and so a, a really fun to be around. What, uh, talent, what talent? I was like, yeah, the whole time. And he's like, I'm just, wow. <laughs> yeah. you know? It was just breathtaking. They actually they all were breathtaking. And you had a lot of comical scenes in there too, which oh, yeah. is really funny. So I just, I enjoyed the, the film totally. It just, um, uh, do you think you'll ever do another surfer documentary about like the now, like the new era? Well, the, I'm involved in a couple of things right now that, that are surfing related. And, you know, I love the ocean. I'm, right. my dad was a lifeguard. You know, I grew up sitting on the beach right next to when I was two years old, actually sitting next to his chair. You didn't have to, way back then, you didn't have stands that you sat in. You, you actually had a chair. That's all they gave you <laughs> uh, and a buoy to, to help you save people. Um, but I was, I was there at the beach and I learned to swim early and, and learned to surf early. And so I'm a, an ocean person. And so for me, um, I'll always be in the ocean. Um, yeah. so it, you know, when I, when I made this film, um, I was really trying to show people that joyous life that I had had kind of that connection to nature that was so fluid and beautiful you were about the same age as the surfers right were you a surfer also did you i was a little bit older than most of them maybe two or three years older than jerry and, and corky um but i was a, i'm a surfer and um my my early specialty in my my first two films was actually writing a surfboard and carrying a waterproof housing with a camera in it and shooting. So I got the first kind of GoPro-ish kind of camera right. shots. Um, and I could also look down at my own feet and walk the nose and hang tan and all that stuff and, and give the audience a sense of the thrill that it is to serve. Yeah, that was my next question because I was just totally amazed. I, I, am I, you know, I'm just thinking about how did this guy shoot the <laughs> amazing scenes? Like, it, it looked like you were like right there, like in the water. And I know I saw a, uh, a picture, a photograph of you actually in the water, uh, you know, uh, with your camera and stuff, uh, you know, filming and stuff. Were you like almost like, right there or were you on the shore and just um zoomed in no no it, both and the 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 main uh, water housing shots in the film in five summer stories some were done by me but most of the good ones were done by this guy bud brown who was one of my best friends a kind of like a father figure to me he was 30 years older than i he was uh, a, a champion swimmer. Um, he was a captain of the USC swim team when he was in college. Um, everyone called him the Barracuda because he was long and tall and skinny like a Barracuda and he could swim faster than anyone. And so he actually figured out a way to take this slow motion camera that we had that had a bunch of batteries with it too. And, uh -huh shot only three minutes of film, but how to waterproof that in housing that he could swim out under the giant waves at Pipeline and Sunset Beach in Hawaii and not get wiped out and destroyed, you know, or killed by, by getting hit by the camera, um, which was heavy. And he got into positions where in slow motion, you, you look at the surfer and you get that sense of everything moving that I described and uh, it it was stunning what, oh, what yeah. we were able to do. Um, I, I pioneered that stuff and then he took it to another lot level. And right. so Ben and I would shoot, I would shoot from shore with a telephoto lens 
with a high speed camera running at slow motion. And then he would go out in the water and shoot from the water. And, and uh, there are some days where we had Jerry Lopez in the, in the, in the surf break and beautiful lighting. And we were just on heaven, heaven's biggest cloud. You know, it was, it was so amazing to a filmmaker to have those kinds of conditions and be able to capture it in a way that no one had ever seen before. Yeah, yeah. Even today, like uh, watching you that film, uh, it's just and you know what the fact that uh, it's now remastered and digitalized. How long did it take uh, the whole process to do that? Because well, over a year. Because um, first we had to find the original negative, <laughs> which is we had in our vault, but finding it was not easy. Um, put it back together again in terms of all the splices and everything, and then master it by transferring it to digital domain. You know, it's film that that's you know over six over fifty years old, and and then um, you know get rid of all the dust particles, sharpen it, make yeah. it perfect, and then do the same thing to the music. And so it's been a, a, a huge effort. And then, then what I did too, is I re-edited the film to utilize all of the best pieces from the various versions that we released from 1972 through 79. So I had a lot to draw from. And so the film I think is actually even more entertaining uh, than it was back in 72. Yeah, I had a lot of great experience on that because uh, my good friend, uh, Ted Kotcheff, who's a Canadian director. Oh, yeah, I know I know about him. Yeah, he did Wake and Fright. And it, if you know anything about that film, it disappeared for so many years and they found it in a warehouse in Pittsburgh. And the film was basically totally ruined, you know? And, you know, they went to work on it and it took years, but, you know, when you watch the film now, it's like breathtaking. <laughs> like, wow. Yeah. But he was even like, you know, like mind blowing effort. So I got the same feeling when I saw your film, you know, oh, I love it. Thank you. I, I love hearing that. Yeah. And, you know, because I'm into the environment and stuff, um, I even got really attached to it even more, more so because I saw all that, all, all that, like the message you were sending, yeah, and, you know, to the world. And I, I think just, it's great that it's a 50 year anniversary, but it's also great, like I said, timing, uh, because I think people need that, especially now with people are in denial with the environment and, and climate change and all that. And I think that will most likely uh, be a very positive uh, uh, sign and a message for people that are deniers, you know, and well, grateful. Yeah, the, I think that unfortunately, just like with tobacco, um, with with oil and in in the, the amount of CO two in the in the atmosphere, there was one loser, and that you know in in any kind of change that you'd make, and that was the oil industry, and so they fought back like the tobacco industry fought back, right? With, with disinformation campaigns and with lies, and 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 they admitted it now. Um, but, you know, there's still people who believe in what they were talking about, which was hogwash. But you end up now seeing some of the impacts with all of these radical events occurring naturally. Um, but they're, they're, they're triggered by um, this pollutant that we put into the, into the atmosphere, which is rising the temperature of our atmosphere. Yeah, it's very easy to to read a, a thermometer, 
Yeah. And we've, had, we've had thermometers for 200 years. And so we realize very easily that we're heating the atmosphere and that it's heating faster than it's ever heated in the history of, of our earth. Right. Well, something's causing that. Um, and it just happens that this is the thing that is causing it. We're using too much fossil fuel. Um, and so we just have to stop it, you know, but we can stop it. Don't yeah, I, I have a quote that goes like, I have a quote that goes like this. If humanity saves nature, nature will save humanity. That's a good one. And that's true. And, you know, we just have to be conscious of it. I mean, but there's all kinds of wonderful stories, even one regarding Ronald Reagan, um, about awareness leading to proper action. Um, and the, the one that I love to tell about Reagan was that the UCI scientists determined that there was an ozone hole and that it was caused by CFCs that are in aerosol sprays. And George Schultz went to, to Reagan and said, we've got this problem and we've got a solution. And Reagan intelligently said, well, how much will it cost if we do nothing in 10 years? And how much will it cost to solve the problem today if we do something? So he came back with the numbers and, and Reagan said, you know what? That's not very much money when you think about it. That's a good insurance policy right. to save our future. And sure enough, they did it. And the ozone hole is closing. Um, you know, we got rid of CFCs. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and it actually cost half as much money as George Schultz said it would cost. Um, you know, because because industry figured out a way to do it even faster and better. And it's if you know the problem, like with the ozone hole, you can create a solution, even if you're a Republican right. uh, who, like Reagan, was, was an anti-growth, anti-big business, or excuse me, anti-big government um, character who, you know, my parents adored him, and, and my uncle was one of his best friends. You know, you end up, though, seeing ways to get to the future that are smarter. You just have to believe that people have the right motivations. Right. Look to their motivations. The oil industry has a motivation of profit. And so they're going to lie to you. Other people, you know, Reagan, he, he looked at his, his motivation was to try to save humanity and save, save, right save nature well that's the key because i believe um i you know i'm in florida right now because i'm a new yorker but i moved to florida a couple of years ago and um i'm surrounded by a lot of republicans but they like me because i told them straight out i said look i don't vote because you're a republican or a democrat i vote if you believe in two things sustainability and humanity if you are for that, I go, I go with you, you know, I vote because if you're not, then I don't, because th those two to me are, are very important yeah. and this earth is very important. And without nature, we are nothing. Yeah. Well, the pro problem with climate is, is uh, if, if right now, we just continue doing what we're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, Florida will be mostly underwater in, in about 30 years. Oh, yeah. And that's not going to be very, very much fun for real no. estate values no. in Florida. No. You know, people right. are going to be moving to higher ground. And, and you know, they're going to get tired of cleaning out the basement and, and actually sweeping the sand out of, out of their front yard. Well, that's what's happening. That yeah. a lot of times when there's a hurricane here, it's like crazy floods everywhere in Miami and so on. And you got to tend to wonder, you want to live like that for the rest of your life? You know, let's do something about it. Let's all unite because I always believe 
the key solution to everything, to any issue is unity. Yeah. Well, and then understanding a, a proper solution that's, that's efficient. Right. Yeah. Right. You know, yeah. scientists have looked at climate change for the last 40 or 50 years. And so they understand how to solve it. They yeah. understand, you know, good, efficient, cost-saving ways to get to the end goal. Yeah. Now and, I noticed that I noticed your partner was Jim Freeman. Yeah. And um, I noticed that you also dedicated the film to him, uh, which is a great honor. You know, can you talk a little bit about him, uh, about <laughs> connecting with him? Yeah, I, I'd love to. I'd, I'd love, love to hear more about him. Yeah. Well, Jim and I um, both individually made surfing films when we were in high school and college. And we met when I was uh, at the University of California and he was at Loma Linda University. And, and uh, he was showing a film up in Santa Barbara and I went to it and, and I went, oh my gosh, this guy is good and he's a good filmmaker and he's, he seems like a fun person. So I went afterwards up to talk to him and, and we became friends and we had similar problems, you know, in dealing with laboratories and dealing with Kodak and, you know, you, everything that a filmmaker goes through. And, uh, and we shared those things on telephone conversations, probably about once a month. And then finally, we decided, you know, after a year or two, that we should make a film together. And that film was called Free and Easy. Um, it took us almost two years to make it. And it, it basically showed us that if we work together, we could make a film that was far better. Right. It was, right. it was almost like one plus one didn't equal two, it equaled three. And it helped us shape our relationship. And, you know, he became my best friend and my business partner and, and our girlfriends were best friends and, and actually still are. But Jim was killed after 12 years that we worked together on multiple films Wow. you know probably 30 movies um he was killed in a helicopter crash and in the in the sierras and they uh um and, it, and that changed my life and and the life of of um, yeah real friends and and the life of our company and so i always love to reflect on who he was as a brilliant filmmaker and what well, wonderful person just to be around because he was so comical and fun and creative and smart and um the joy that we had making films together and yeah. you know, I've, I've kept going you know we made two fly together their first imax film and then he was killed shortly thereafter and and so i continued on making IMAX films and keeping his name on those films because, you know, he helped decide the direction of our company and he helped right. That's a become a better filmmaker and, and so forth. And so, you know, it's, it's been a long time since he passed away, but, but I still think about him every day. Yeah. I see because your company still has his name on it, which is a uh, also yeah you know, a great thing, you know, I named my company Angel Light Pictures after my brother Angel who died 36 years ago in a car accident. You uh -huh. know? So, you know, we do things because, you know, he was my mentor, like he's probably, uh, he's your friend, but he's also part mentor of yours. And yeah. it's a great honor. So when I saw it at the end of the film, I said, wow, you know, that's, that's great, you know. I, I always see things like that because the film is very passionate. It's a blessing. And I, and I thank you for this film. I really oh, do. Thanks. I, I love to hear that. Thank you. To bring something back from 1972 and bring it back now. And I'm, I'm watching it and uh, it was just fantastic. Uh, I'm an ocean guy too, but I saw it because it's more than that. It's, it's an art form. 
and you developed it and it's beautiful. Thank you. And it's appreciate meeting you. Um, it's in theaters across the U.S. and, and Canada, right? And it begins on August 12th, correct? Correct, yeah. I have, I'm going to have to run to an iMac uh, and see it because uh, I watch it on my big screen television. So I want to yeah. get full effect at the <laughs> theater itself because I'm pretty sure I want to feel like I'm in the water. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's important. So it was a pleasure meeting you, and God bless, and have a wonderful uh, press day today. Oh, thank you so much. Great talking to you. Thank you. Bye-bye.